Welcome to Talk the Line with Matt Pinsker. I have a very special guest today, Mr. Jay Ibsen, who's a Holocaust survivor. Why don't you introduce yourself to everyone? Uh, hi, I'm Jay Ibsen. I'm an old guy at this point, and I survived the Holocaust. I also built the Virginia Holocaust Museum in Richmond. And when I came to the United States, I was 12 years old. Couldn't speak a single word of English other than okay. And uh, that I learned from the GIs in Munich because every time they were walking down the street, nice, handsome young men in un uniform with the Ike jackets and going down the street chewing gum and saying okay. So that's the way I thought you spoke English. So when I came to the United States, I thought all I'd had to do is chew gum and say, okay. Uh, the gum, of course, came from the packages that used to have the sea rations, chiclish chewing gum, and they would have a conversation accord, uh, basically like the people nowadays, the young people say, you know what I mean? Well, that used to be okay in my generation. Oh, okay. Now, what year? How old? What year were you born? Let's go into how old you are. I was born in 1935 in June. Where? Fifth. Uh, I will be 84. I was born in Kovna, Lithuania. And how old were you when the Germans rolled in? Well, first the Russians rolled in in 1941. Uh, Hitler made a deal with the Russians because he was afraid of the Russians to divide up Europe. So they split Poland, and the Russians came into Lithuania. My father was a Jewish lawyer, and when uh, Hitler took over Germany and passed the Nuremberg Laws, all Jews lost most of their rights to uh, law, doctors, and all that kind of stuff. And of course, the Lithuanians were the first ones to adopt the German restrictions and my father could no longer practice law, so he went into the motorcycle business. And it's a long story, but he was very successful. We, uh, our showroom was in our living room because when he started, he didn't have any money for a showroom. And mother and he were both working side by side as I am a wife work side by side every single day since our marriage. And both of them sold the same motorcycle in the very beginning, and the business grew. And just as he got himself established, Hitler realized that he no longer needed the Russians because the British and the Americans were not going to stop him. So uh, he just attacked Russia, and... We lost everything, actually. The, the Russians have a fantastic system. When they came into Lithuania, they confiscated, which means take away, everything that we owned. Our whole motorcycle inventory, our bank account, our notes receivable. And my father had to go find a job. And he found a job with the Russians uh, in a cooperative where they had horse and wagon. So when uh, Hitler turned on the Russians and everybody started escaping for their lives, uh, the Russian soldiers and all, trying to uh, evade or escape from the Germans, my father came with a horse and buggy. I had a uh, six-month-old sister at that time, and he said to my mother, grab the children, we're going to run with the Russians, at least we're going to be alive, because we had already heard what the Germans were doing to the Jews in Poland as they were trying so, to escape from Poland. They were coming to Lithuania. So how old were you at the time, and what had you heard about what the uh, Germans were doing? At the time, I was six years old. And, of course, I wasn't in politics. I didn't understand all I knew is that my mother and father had an open house and everybody that was coming through that needed a meal or something. My mother was a fantastic cook, <coughs> excuse me, and she would uh, have food ready 
and the Polish Jews as they were coming in would have something to eat. At the same time, we had a Japanese council, Chu in Chukahara. Contrary to what his government said, he issued transit visas for anybody that would show up at his office, which was not far away, and my father used to help Polish Jews go to his house, and he was issuing transit visas, and that's a very long story as well. Was that risky for your family safety to be helping out, helping others survive? At that point, no, because uh, the Lithuanians had not had a chance yet to turn on the Jews. That was about another 30 days down the road. So uh, I was out in the street looking up at the sky and I saw something coming out of the sky and it was a German plane strafing. Well, I didn't know what strafing was. I was fascinated by the airplane and things were flying around me and I didn't know that it were bullets and as he made a pass and climbed back up, somebody grabbed me, pulled me in the house, and in the time we had those great big radios known as AM radios, you could hear all over the world on them, and somebody grabbed me, pulled me in, and when I came into the house I heard the radio blasting, Uwaga, Uwaga, Uwaga. That means in Russian, attention, attention, attention. Hitler betrayed us, we have been attacked the Russian soldiers start withdrawing to protect Mother Russia. My father came with a horse and buggy, grabbed Mother and my sister, and we started running with the uh, rest of the refugees trying to escape the Germans. And the Germans dropped paratroopers in front of us, cut off our escape, Some of the Russian soldiers took to the woods and became partisans. Some of them were killed, and we were told to go back where we came from. My uh, mother did not have, because of the situation, sufficient milk to feed my sister. So we stopped at a farmhouse, and in those days they didn't have pasteurized milk. You got what you could, and unfortunately... She got bad milk and got stomach poisoning and died as soon as we came back home where we were. At that point, our Lithuanian neighbors, led by a Catholic priest, uh, started attacking and killing Jews in the street. They dragged them to a service station known as Letuka's Garage, beat them to the ground, and murdered them. They also uh, went to the rabbi's house, one guy did, and with a saw cut off his head and paraded it through the street like we do a jack-o'-lantern on Valentine's Day. Why were the Lithuanians turning on the Jews like this? I mean, they were the, in the midst Catholic of The Catholic Church, unfortunately, was teaching hate. And the whole uh, massacre was led by a Catholic priest known as Jonas Jankuskas. That was his name. And where do you think he ended up? I'd hope he was prosecuted afterwards. Well, actually, he escaped to the United States and became a leader in New Jersey of a uh, Lithuanian uh, old age home. And when OSI, Office of Special Investigation, discovered him a few years ago, well, it's more than a few years now, it's about 10 years ago, they deported him to Lithuania, and he received a hero's welcome when he came back to Lithuania. And guess what? He was collecting Social Security until he died about two years ago. That's disturbing. It's the truth. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, I saw the videos of Nuremberg. I saw you know, how we hung them afterwards. Wish we could have done that to more of them. For what people Lithuania, like that. for the most part, the Lithuanian escaped that kind of a uh, ending. When the Russians went back into Lithuania and uh, took it over after the war, of course, the uh, Lithuanians blamed the Jews for all their problems. 
the Jews suffered under the Russians just like the Lithuanians did. But on the first go around when the Russians came into Lithuania, when they made a deal with Hitler, they deported the intelligentsia. And in the intelligentsia, as many Jews were deported as the Lithuanian hierarchy. But the Lithuanians blamed the Jews that it was the Jews that caused the communism and it was the Jews that caused them to lose their country to the Russians. It's amazing how stupid can, some people can be. Uh, I'd like to really hear more of your story, though, how you survived the Holocaust. Uh, le- just left off where your sister had died for spoiled milk. And what happened next after that point? Well, after that, when the uh, Germans came in and after the massacre that the Lithuanians had, they put us in a ghetto, a barbed wire compound, where all of us had to move in regardless. It was a very small area. How small are we talking? Uh, How many people were there? 27,000. And uh, the area was probably better for 5,000. Wow. And on October 28, 1941, an order came that all the Jews of the ghetto, young, old, it didn't matter, infant, uh, people that couldn't help themselves, had to come out to a field known as Democratic Field, Democratic Field. There we stood in front of a German sergeant by the name of Rocker and he went over to the head of each family and said, Was is dein Beruf auf Fluchter Jude? What is your profession, dem Jew? If you were a doctor, a lawyer, a businessman, a rabbi, an engineer, you and your whole family were sent to the left. If you were a ditch digger, a garbage collector, uh, an outhouse cleaner, because we didn't have plumbing. Uh, We had people that collected the stuff from the outhouses. Uh, You and your whole family went to the right. When Rocker came over to my father and said, Was ist dein Beruf auf Luchter Jude? He didn't know why. But on the spare of the moment, he said, Looks like all the guys going to the right is better than the left. He said, Ich bin ein Automobilmechaniker. I'm a car mechanic. My father didn't know anything about being a car mechanic. He was a lawyer. He was a businessman. Rocker told him, take your family and go to the right. Along with us, some of our neighbors that felt more comfortable with my father had snuck into our family group. And we all went home. The very next morning, there was a banging on our door. A German with a rifle came. He said, ich bin, I'm looking for the car mechanic. My father realized that if he didn't fess up, the family could possibly be in danger. He said, ich bin der Automobilmechaniker. I'm the car mechanic. The German said, come with me. He took him three kilometers away from the ghetto where there was an airport, Alex Sot. Uh, he took him into the Quonset hut, said to him, this is my vehicle, can you fix it? My father spoke German, he said, naturally, certainly not a problem. How long will it take? My father said, oh, a couple of days, figuring that in a couple of days he would have to take him back. And he would ask his friends how to fix it. So the German said, I don't have a couple of days, fix it now. Well, what seems to be the problem? Well, you the mechanic, you tell me when I drive it, there's a banging underneath my seat. I don't know what the problem is. My father said, I tell you what, I'm going to lay down on the ground face up. You drive over top of me. And I'll see what the problem is. Figuring that if he drove over top of him and killed him, that's a chance he had to take. Otherwise, he'd shoot him for lying. My father lay down on his back. The German drove over top of him. And when he drove over top, my father saw that the universal joint, and every car has two, some four, was banging underneath the seat. 
and he saw the markings. So he told the uh, German that, uh, okay, I see what the problem is, I will fix it. The German went away. Now my father didn't know what kind of tools to ask for. So he went to the tool room and asked for an adjustable wrench, just like I wear the one on my tie all the time, except a larger one. With that and his bare hands, he unbolted the universal joint, took it into the parts room, showed it to the guys and said, I need one of these. The guys realized my father didn't know what really he needed. They gave him the proper universal joint with the proper tools. He put it back together, tightened everything up, went over to the German and said, I've got it fixed, would you like to try it? The German got in the vehicle, drove it a couple of blocks, came back, said, it's perfect. You're the finest mechanic I've ever seen. You will now be the shop foreman. And here is a loaf of bread and butter for you. My father refused the bread and butter. Our rations for the week were 934 calories for that, seven days. 934 calories 934. A Big Mac and French fries is 1,020 calories. How did you live on that? You didn't. It was tough. So you smuggled food. If you got caught, you were executed. In fact, I was forced to watch an execution of a young man by the name of Mac. He was 18 years old. They hung him in Democratic Square. And I didn't finish telling you the story of Democratic Square, but uh, I had to watch. And they put the noose backwards, and I remember he threshing about like a... Uh, no. minnow at the end of a fishing line. So my father refused the bread. The guy that uh, the German told my father, get in the vehicle, the one he had just fixed, and he drove him into the ghetto to our house and watched him take the bread and butter into the house. Now, I told you, started telling you before my father was asked for a mechanic. That night, 10,500 men, women, and children were executed. 4,222 children. So, anyhow, uh, my father went in with the bread, came into the house. Mother cut off a slice, gave it to me. And I took a couple of bites and ran out into the street. There were bigger kids there. They were also very hungry. One of them came over to me and said, Jay, I will give you this little airplane. He took a couple of pieces of wood, put it cross over. He says, for the rest of your bread. So I gave him my bread. I had already had a couple of bites, grabbed the airplane and ran into the house so nobody would take my toy away from me because all my toys, everything I had, including all of my good clothes that my father had brought me from Belgium and all, uh, were confiscated. And I'll let you figure out what my mother did to me for giving away my uh, bread for a piece of wood. While working at the airport, my father met a farmer. Now, I was in three different selections with my mother. The first one, of course, my father saved us. The second one was a call for children and parents. And when we got there, the Germans changed their mind and sent us home. The third selection was a selection of uh, 2,700 Jews to go from Kovna, Lithuania, to Riga, Latvia, for a work detail. They started grabbing Jews off of the street, and when they didn't make the quota, they came going house to house grabbing families. My mother, while working at the airport loading coal and working on the runway, one guard got displeased how she was working, and they hit her with the rifle butt over her head, cutting it open. A doctor sewed it up, 
gave her a special note and they did observe notes from doctors that they, she couldn't work for a few days. So she happened to be home and I was with her. Her parents, brothers and sister were home from shift change. They came to our house, they grabbed us up for the disportation to Riga, Latvia and Estonia. As we were in line, a Jewish policeman that was a friend of my father's recognized me, grabbed me, pulled me out of line and said, go home, daddy will be looking for you and take mother with you. My mother didn't want to leave her family but I started crying that I wanted to go to my father. She followed me. Mother and I are the only two that survived. And I have a picture of me in line with mother for the deportation. I'm sorry, I have just have chills down my spine hearing this. This is, wow. <laughs> I'll show you the picture. I've got it in my pocket. I'd like to see it. That little boy is me. It's our viewers. And the circle, you can have that. Oh, thank you. So, uh, how did you come across this picture? Well, that's a long story. You want to hear that too? Maybe the shorter <laughs> version. I, I really want to hear about your story. The shorter so. version is that a photographer by the name of Kadushin when they took everything away from us, did not turn in his camera. He had a 35 millimeter camera and he hid it. And he took pictures in the ghetto through the buttonhole of his coat or he'd go up in the attic and come down from the attic openings and take pictures of what was going on. In uh, 1998, I was... Uh, getting ready to give a lecture for the Valentine Museum. Having been in the American Army as an instructor, I knew kids don't like to listen to old people. You know, you got to show and tell. And I used to operate an overhead projector. So uh, I called up Washington and I said, hey guys, I remember the following things. And I understand that you have some pictures of the Kovna ghetto. Would you have any of what I'm telling you? They say, oh, your explanation is so valid that we can give you 21 pictures on that, exactly what you're describing. I said, would you send them to me? So they sent me the pictures, and when, and when I went through them, I couldn't believe it. It couldn't possibly be me. So my father used to go on Fridays on Commerce Road at Honesty's Lebanese restaurant. And every Friday they used to fix fried trout for them, him and his friends, and they'd have a get together. So I called up my father, he was still alive at the time. I said, Dad, look, uh, let's go have some lunch at Honesty's. I didn't tell him my ulterior motive. He said, oh, great. So I picked him up, he had retired already, and we went to Honesty's, placed our order. I said, by the way, I've got the following pictures and I'm going to give a lecture. Can you help me identify them? We started going through the pictures. He says, oh, there is your grandfather. I was waving to him as they were putting him on the truck, and that's you and your mother. Wow. So that made, you know... I was positive then that I wasn't imagining that that little boy was me. And uh, that's the story of that selection. Um, while we're here, though, you have uh, a show, This Yellow Star. Could you talk about this? Did this, you wear one? We had to wear one of those on the front and back of our clothing. So we would be easily identified as you could do anything you wanted to us. Nobody would bother you. Jews were not allowed to walk on the sidewalk. Jews were not allowed to sit on public benches. Jews were not allowed to go into theaters. 
Jews were not allowed to go to certain schools. Jews were not allowed to go to universities. Jews could not, uh, a Jewish male could not sit with a nun, uh, with an Aryan woman on the same bench. So, uh, well, this is where uh, you know, my experience in civil rights and the law is that I, I know the Germans got a lot of their ideas for uh, for segregation with the Jews from the American South, from the democratic segregation plans. Well, so, I'll go Jim even Crow. a little further with you. The Central State Hospital, are you familiar with Central State Hospital? Yes. That's where they took care of people that they didn't like. They sterilized them. They did all sorts of surgery on them. And some of the things that the Germans did in experimenting came from what was going on at Central State Hospital right here in Virginia. That's one of the greatest shames of the American South is that uh, you know Jim Crow was the plan book for Hitler's plan for the Jews to right. segregate them. Exactly. Except that Hitler went a little further. He, he started murdering us. And uh, let's, let, I like going on uh, with your story as uh, you know, what you experienced. Uh, I think we left off with the airplane. Uh, toy. Well, shortly after afterwards? that, my father realized that if we didn't escape, we would be annihilated. He was extremely well known. He spoke six languages. He had helped Lithuanian farmers. My, grand, my mother's uncle was a farmer, and my mother and him used to visit them on the farm quite frequently. And the uh, my mother's uncle was very generous to his neighbors whenever they had problems with not growing something he was always ready to help the jews have a law if you're a farmer that every seventh year you've got to let the re land rest so it doesn't absorb all the chemicals from the soil so being a smart men like he was, he divided up his farm into seven parcels. And every year a different parcel would be left barren so it could regenerate itself. So he always had a good crop. His neighbors weren't so lucky when they used up this stuff, so whenever they needed help, he would go to them. Uh, they would come to him, borrow some seed, to replant, to get going again. And he was very generous to him. So they protected him. And my father and mother used to, my father rode a motorcycle, so they used to go to the country to visit him. While my father was working at the airport, one of those farmers came to the airport to see if he could sell some of his produce to some of the Germans or the Jews that were working at the airport. They connected, and he told my father that if he could escape through the f barbed wire fence, they would meet up and he would take us to the country and get us a place to hide. So my father made arrangements with him, and in the middle of November 1943, in the middle of the night, my father cut the barbed wire, and I was told to run across the street and hide behind the fence. I knew the neighborhood. It was where I used to play in all the time. At that time, I was six years, I was eight years old. I ran across, hid behind the fence. It seemed like forever till my mother came out. Now, how do you think my mother found me in the middle of a dark November night? How did she? Hey, Jay, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> Since we knew the neighborhood, she touched the ground. We touched. We never said a word to each other. And you were about seven, eight years old at I the time? I was seven, eight. Eight years old, and you understood the importance of being silent. You understood course, the threat. Oh, yes. And uh, again, as the God made another pass, my father came out. Likewise, he found us. 
we walked five blocks where the farmer that I told you about was waiting for us with a wagon full of straw, not hay, straw. I was buried under the straw so nobody could see me. My mother was dressed like a farm woman sitting next to him and my father walked the team till we came to uh, Trakai in, in Lithuania, about 45 miles away or kilometers from Kovna. And there, a Polish Catholic farmer whose house wasn't much bigger than your studio hit us. His house had a dirt floor. It didn't have a chimney. It had a fireplace, and when they cooked in the fireplace or to warm the place up, half of the house filled up with smoke. They had one table, one bed where the farmer, his wife, and 16-year-old son used to sleep, and a little compound where the sheep, after they took off the wool, kept them in there so they wouldn't freeze. They had two sheep. They offered to hide us. We hid in the barn, and my father knew that it was going to be dangerous, and if he didn't do something, we could get caught and all of us would be executed. So in the middle of the night, they had a German shepherd called Rexy. Rexy became our guardian. When he started barking or something, we knew there was something in the neighborhood that we had to be extra quiet. So at night, my father went out into the woods and Paskowskas, the farmer, had a potato hole. In uh, the country, they kept potatoes in the winter time to have them to eat and as well to have enough to start the following year for cups. Uh, so my father went down in the potato hole, started digging a tunnel and he was going to open up a shaft and ultimately he built it but in the process of building it it caved in on him because he was not an engineer and he didn't realize that if you dig underground and don't shore it up he didn't have anything to shore it up with it can cave in on you and it did he was uh, and Rexy always accompanied him if Rexy started barking, my father would stop work. Rexy started barking, and Stashuk, the farmer's 18-year-old son, was coming back from playing fiddle at a hoedown. He heard his dog barking with an unusual bark. He came running, and he saw a hand sticking out from underneath the ground. He quickly opened up my father's face, ran and got his parents, and together they dug my father out, saving his life. After that, whenever Paskowskas would chop down wood, in those days, not many saws, axe, uh, he would leave pieces for my father so he could show up the place. My father was on his deathbed, and I asked him, I said, Dad, not having nails, not being able to use a hammer, how did you hold this stuff up while you were building the hiding place, nine by 12 by four foot high? 13 of us ended up hiding in it. He said he took wheat stalks, made rope out of it, tied it together and pushed it against the walls and hoped that I wouldn't knock into them to break them down. And uh, we spent six months, nine months in hiding and six months in that potato hole. We were liberated by the Russians, and after liberation, we came, uh, the first thing my father and I did is we grabbed me, and we came back to the concentration camp. In 1943, the Germans changed the ghetto to the concentration camp. The difference between the ghetto and the concentration camp, they're both the same. They work you in both, they starve you in both, and they kill you in both. The difference is a ghetto is for the local populace. Like if you take a circle and draw around your studio here, this becomes a ghetto for us. Now, if we got visitors in and more people come in, 
it now becomes a concentration camp. So both of them are the same, and in 1943, when after they killed off so many of us, they started getting more people in from other areas and changed it to a concentration camp. So the first thing we did is go see perhaps some of my father's family was still alive. After killing everybody, as the Germans were retreating, they set the concentration camp on fire. When we got there, the concentration camp was still smoldering. My father knew of a bunker that if any of his family survived, this is where they would be. So he, uh, we went to the bunker and we looked inside and there was a burned body of a woman that was burned beyond recognition. We don't know whether that was my aunt, his sister, or not. But on the ground, we found a ration card that had her name on it. So we knew at one point she was there. We never saw any of my father's or mother's family again. So... After you returned to the concentration camp, or what was left of it, uh, it sounds like the Russians were they now in power, had taken back over. So the what Ru did you do next, and how did you end up end up making your way toward to America? The Russians, of course, took over, and my father went to work for the Russians. While working for the Russians, women that came back from the concentration camp, very few survived. Out of 220,000 Jews that lived in Lithuania, less than 5,000 survived. Only 118 children, I'm one of those. They came looking for work. My father put them to work. So they worked hard, and they did such a good job that when you do a good job for the Russians, they give you the Russian flag. That's your recognition. So my father's cooperatives, he was in charge of five different ones, got the Russian flag. One of them was a cookie factory. So my father took some cookies and gave it to the ladies to uh, take care for the special work that he did. They sold them on the black market. My father was coming on his bicycle home for lunch in those days, you just bicycled if you could. And he heard his name. They had loudspeakers on the middle of the street, like we have Monument Avenue in Richmond. We had a street like that in Kovna. It was called Leisvesaleje, the uh, monument-type street. He heard his name on the loudspeakers that he was the enemy of the Soviet Republic because he gave away cookies that he had no right to do it. He came into the house, told my mother, we've got to leave immediately. Whatever clothes you can put in a backpack, put in there, and we're leaving. So that night we escaped, made our way through Poland, and got to the Czech border. What was it like getting to the border? Uh, it can't be an easy journey when you're the enemy of the state of the Soviet Union. I mean, you didn't have, it doesn't sound like you had much with you as far as money, bribe people, good no, trade. No, but uh, my father was always looking ahead. My mother's name was Butrymovich. Butrymovich is a Polish name. So they had some forged documents under the name of Butrymovich because the Russians were letting the Poles go back home. So if we got stopped by a Russian and he saw Butrymovich, he realized that we were Poles trying to get back to Poland. And we got into Warsaw. It's a long story, more than we can tell right now. And uh, ultimately, we escaped trying to make it to the American zone. We... Uh, got to Warsaw, and from Warsaw we went trying to get to the Czech border. We knew of an area and how to get there. So we tried to get on a train of cattle cars. The uh, guy that was in charge of the trains was a Russian captain. 
my father, one of the cooperatives that my father was working at, made boots. So my father had a new pair of boots that he wore for himself. He asked the Russian that he wanted to get on the cattle car to go to the Czech border from Warsaw to the Czech. The Russian told him, no way, Jose, you can't go. He looked, my father looked down and the guy's boots were all wore out and my father's were all like brand new. My father said, look, if you let us let get onto that cattle car, I will give you my boots. The Russian said, deal. My father took off his new boots, gave it to the Russian, took his old boots. We got on the cattle car and we got to the Czech border. And just so we can keep the timeline straight, what year was this? This was in 1946, world beginning, end of 45. And you were at what age? At that point, I was 10. Okay. So uh, we got to the Czech border, and uh, the Czechs would not let anybody through. So Why? Because they were protecting their side, and uh, they just... That was it. You, you didn't have roaming like we do at our border now. You didn't go. They stopped you. So uh, we uh, got stopped, and my father saw that there were problems with uh, people being rejected and imprisoned. And he saw, my father was a brilliant individual, he saw a guide that was hanging out. So he went over and he said, look, can you help me get through the woods around the border, just like what they're doing now? And the guy said, no, I can't uh, because I'm waiting for a big group that I'm going to have to take across. He says, but if you go such and such through the woods, when you come out on the other end of the woods, you're going to be on past the border and you'll be back at the point of crossing to the American zone. My father said, okay. So he took, my father did not know anything about woods. He was not an outdoorsman. How he did it, I don't know. The snow was up to my waist. My mother uh, had a backpack. I had a backpack with a down blanket on. And my father had a backpack. And we started out through the woods. After a certain point, I stopped. I said, I don't care if they kill me. I can't take another step. My father took my backpack off, gave it to my mother, picked me up, put it on his backpack, and we kept on going. We went through most of the night, and all of a sudden, we saw a light. Well, we didn't know where we were going, so we headed for that light. When we got there, my father knocked on the door, and a guy came out in a pair of military uniform with a uh, insulated undershirt, and it's, what do you want? My father says, we're trying to get to the border. The guy said, just a minute. He went back into the house, got us a sandwich, and when he came out, he was in full uniform with a gun. And he said, come with me. My father whispered to me, he says, we got a problem, but I don't know what's going to happen. But we got no choice. He's got the gun. And he's leading us. He took out what became known Checkpoint Charlie. Told the guy at the gate, open up the gate, which was a up and down, you know. Led them through. And he told us, when you get on the other side, you're going to be in the French zone. That particular spot happened to be Checkpoint Charlie. We got to the French zone, and ultimately we managed 
to get through, and we finally got to the American zone. And so, how did life change once you uh, got to the American zone? Well, it was a while yet. We found by word of mouth a safe house where we stayed overnight, and then kept on going through Berlin, which was bummed out. And ultimately, and I don't know the exact dates. I didn't keep track. All I know is we kept going and going, and we got to Munich. When we got to Munich, we were lucky. In Munich, they had the American Joint Distribution Committee, AJDC, and UNRWA, United Nations Relief Organization. And uh, that was a Meldstrasse 3. So my father found his way there, and as luck would have it, the head of the transportation company that was running all the vehicles for the DPs and the civilian Jews and uh, American soldiers and such had gotten a visa to come to the United States and his job was open. And he knew my father. He took him in to uh, the joint and they gave my father the job of being in charge of all the transportation. In that particular job, they also... uh, worked the illegal immigration to uh, Israel. My father was in charge of all the vehicles that were for civilian use and for American soldiers that uh, were working in the government. So uh, while working there, he organized an illegal immigration to Palestine. But he would take, uh, you had, the British did not allow Jews to go to Palestine. That Arabs had control of it, and the Jews couldn't go. So uh, the British didn't want them, so they were operating an illegal immigration, like the ship Exodus that everybody knows about that uh, tried to make it to uh, Palestine. So my father would uh, take the trucks, go to the DP camps, they'd pick up Jews and take them to the port of Constance in France, and then there they would get on ships trying to make it and see if they could make Palestine because the only people that were legally allowed was 500 certificates a month, and that was for an orphan and an escort. Well, the British made a fuss with the Americans, and they caught my father's trucks. Can we take a break? Oh, absolutely. Welcome back to Talk the Line with Matt Pensker. We have a Holocaust survivor, Jay Ibsen. He was telling us uh, how he survived the Holocaust. Now he's working on how he got to America. Well, while i uh, got another little story I'm going to tell you before that, uh, there was Rabbi Klausner, an American chaplain, and he uh, managed, his commanding officers were fantastic. They let him do whatever he wanted to, and he didn't have to stay with the unit. And he found a printer, and he found some Hebrew print. And in 1946, he and my father established the first Passover Seder in the Deutsches Museum in Munich the same place where Hitler and his henchmen used to party, the Jewish community of Munich and some of the American Jewish soldiers celebrated the first Passover in 1946, and I've got a copy of that Haggadah, which is the story of Passover. Anyhow, my father used to furnish the trucks and his trucks got uh, 
confiscated. How were they confiscated? Uh, the British made a fuss with the Americans, said you're allowing the Jews to go to the port of Constance, it's in your territory, and they are coming to Israel or Palestine at that time, and you're not stopping them. So a, uh, the CID, which is Criminal Investigation Police of the military, saw a group of trucks heading to the port of Constance. They caught them. They took the DP back to their camps, and the trucks were confiscated and taken back to the motor pool in Munich. My father got a call from the commanding officer of Munich that he got his trucks, they were confiscated, and for him to come and explain himself. My father came to the headquarters. He walked into the commanding officer's, who was a colonel, uh, office. There was a beautiful German secretary. The colonel was sitting with his feet on his desk, as is an American custom and smoking a cigar. The, guy, the colonel said to the secretary, since he, my father didn't speak English, said, uh, ask him what he wants, you know, as a challenge. My father, to make time and figure he'd get the secretary warmed up so that the exchange wouldn't be so bad, said, well, the first thing I would want him to do is take his feet off his desk because it's not polite to sit that way in front of a lady. She told the colonel. The colonel took his feet off the desk <laughs> and he said, what do you want? My father said, well, I would like to have my trucks back. Your trucks were taking Jews illegally to the port. My father said, no, they weren't. They were going on a picnic. There are no good signs out there, and they got lost, and I want my trucks back. My, the colonel said... So, just so we're clear, they weren't really going on a picnic, though, right? They of were, course not. They were going to the ship. Okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> so uh, the uh, colonel says to my father, he said, your drivers... Uh, driving around in jeeps that have cabins on them. In those days, all the jeeps didn't have like we have now, no cabins. You know, they weren't closed in. He said, and my officer, my CID people, they're running around in this freezing cold in open jeeps. I want you to fix my jeeps like you have fixed yours. My father said, I can't fix your jeeps. He says, well, you want your trucks back? He says, well, if you'll give me a script to go in the PX, give me cigarettes, then we can make a deal. And so they made a deal. My father took the cigarettes and got German carpenters like he had done on his Jeeps to fix the Jeeps. And with some of the script and other stuff, he and Rabbi Klausner built the first synagogue in Munich after the, uh, you know, the liberation. Make a long story short, my parents want to go to Palestine, but they can't. My mother refused to be separated from my father. So she had a sister and an aunt here in Richmond. They found out Rabbi Klausner posted our names of Holocaust survivors in New York, and they found out we had survived, and we made contact with them. So they uh, wanted to bring us to the United States, and we uh, got the proper paperwork, and we go to the American consul to see about getting permission to come to the United States. Well, 
when we get to the American Council, there are all sorts of cubicles for different consuls because they're trying to get a lot of the immigrants to come through. And everybody says, Caesars, my father's friends that are waiting to go, and they tell him, oh, if the consul you got, he rejects everybody. He doesn't let anybody to go through. So my father said, well, if that's God's will, so be it. So uh, we get into the consul's office, and he holds up a wad of green cotton, and he says to me, what color is that? I said, green. He said, good. If nothing else, you can wash Pepsi-Cola bottles. We had no idea what Pepsi-Cola was. So uh, he passed us, and we had to go to the port of Bremen, where we had to wait for a ship while uh, being there because of the delay and all the dirt and all. I picked up a terrible case of Atlas foot. Finally, we got the uh, SS Marina, Maryland, came, and we made our way to the United States. In the middle of the uh, journey, the engines broke down on the ship, and we bounced around like crazy. And mother kept telling me, eat, 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 because the food on the ship was plentiful. Everybody was throwing up <laughs> because of getting seasick, and mother kept forcing me to eat. But you just throw up some more if you keep eating. <laughs> <laughs> well, in addition to that, they had a uh, commissary, and everybody was going around with sunglasses. I went over to my father and I said, you know, I'd like to have a pair of sunglasses. I didn't have anything. And I remember like today, he took me in the commissary. I think they were, what, 50 cents or something at that time. And I wanted a pair of sunglasses. They were all sold out. The only thing they had was a pair of white woman's sunglasses. He bought them for me. You got your sunglasses. I got my sunglasses. We made it to New York, and we got to New York. The first thing my mother did is go buy me an orange. I had never had an orange before, but she bought me an orange. What did you think of your first orange? Uh, it was just like heavenly, you know. I, I didn't know. I'd never eaten one before, and it tasted so good, and of course, haven't been starved, you know, you're just other than on the ship. So uh, it was very nice. And uh, my mother's brother... Sorry, she, when, when you still eat oranges, do you just bring you back to that moment? Is it, are oranges just your favorite fruit now? Well, it's one of my favorite fruits. My, my wife fixed me one every night in my vegetables that I get. I get a couple of slices of orange. My mother's brother came uh, with her uncle, came to pick us up in New York and put us on a train to Richmond. In those days, I don't know if you remember, you probably don't, everybody had a pair of shoes that were white on, 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 on so this in is the movies they time. show that shoe. I've seen the movies, but uh, I'm 31 years old, so... Before my time. My uncle uh, wore a pair of shoes like that. I still can see those shoes. And they put, put us on a train, and GIs were coming back from the war, and there weren't any seats. And I was wore out. And my uncle went over to one of the GIs and said, How about giving up your seat? To this kid, he needs to rest. The guy got up, gave me his seat, and the next thing I knew, we were in Richmond, and the uh, Main Street Station is where we landed. When we came in Main Street Station, my mother's uncle 
came with a big packard that they had in those days. And that's what I found out what Pepsi Cola was. They owned Pepsi Cola. Wow. That's how come we got permission to come to the United States. What year was this? 1947. And in 1947, June was that, 12th. June 12th, 1947. Was that the same Main Street Station as we have right here in Richmond today? Yes. Wow. It sure was. Most people know about it today. It's because it's right by Bottoms of Pizza, but... <laughs> No, but I remember it as the Main Street Station. And uh, just trying to keep the timeline straight, how old were you now? Twelve. I was as I was twelve on the ship. Uh, my birthday is June fifth, and we came to Richmond June twelfth. So uh, my birthday was actually on the ship. We didn't celebrate it. We didn't have anything to celebrate with, but. Uh, so what were your thoughts about Richmond after everything you'd lived through and experienced and survived? You're now living in Richmond in 1947. What was your reaction as a 12-year-old? Well, for one thing, my mother's sister said, when you're outside of the house, you only speak English. The only word of English I knew was okay. Didn't know how to speak English. And we came, we stayed with my mother's sister, and it was June. They lived on the second floor on Kutschau Avenue, and I used to go out on the porch. There were a couple of kids riding bicycles back and forth and motioning for me to come down. I was scared. I couldn't speak to them wouldn't come down. My aunt came home from work and she says, George said if you'll come down, he will let you ride his bicycle. Well, that was a good incentive. So I came down and from June to September, I learned some English from George and my aunt and uh, he let me ride his bicycle. Where in Richmond did you live? And what was it like to playing with the kids when you We lived speak? with her. We lived with my aunt. Where in Richmond was this? On Augusta Avenue. Kutcha. I mean, Kutcha Avenue. So, uh... Yeah, what was it like playing with kids uh, when you know, just came to America I didn't speak the language? But it seems like you got along fine. Well, we'll get to it. So, uh... George was... At that time, I came home with a bad case of athlete's foot that I had picked up at Bremenhaven because of the sanitary conditions and all. My uncle served in the Pacific during World War II, and somehow they had a special medicine for athlete's foot, and he brought it home because he had problems in the Pacific. And he gave it to me. And that stuff burned like you wouldn't believe. So anyhow, come September, I'm 12 years old. I need to go to school. I had no education. The only education I had was math. And I learned that in the potato hole by killing lice. For six months living in the potato hole, I didn't have a change of clothes, didn't have a bath, and lived in the dirt. So I was covered with lice. And of course, we also had company mice. So every day, my challenge was to pop the lice between my thumbs as I was pulling them off of me and counting them. And uh, the idea was every day hoping to get more than the day before. If I did, I added. If not, I subtracted. And my father taught me the multiplication and division table. When we came to uh, the States, I was good in math. History, I lived it. Everybody in those days, the current history, what was going on. So I knew the history. So come September. September, need to go to school. They take me to Robert E. Lee's school on Kensington Avenue. They look at me. They say, you need to be in the sixth grade. I'm 12 years old. 
no previous education. They stick me in the sixth grade because of my age. Well, I was an A student in math. I was good in history because I lived it. In those days, you saw Frank Sinatra singing My Little City and all that kind of stuff, so I was up to snuff on it. Uh, the one thing I was not good at was English. So at the end of the year, I flunked English. Got a nice big red F. They sent me to John Marshall Summer School. I spent the summer in the school, come back to the teacher that flunked me the following year, and she gives me a retest, and she says, good, you've improved. You go to Albert H. Hill. So I went to Albert H. Hill, and the story repeated itself. I go to summer school all summer, no air conditioning in those days. You were lucky if you sat by an open window or near a fan. And the same story, I do good on everything else, but I flunk English. And that goes till I get to uh, TJ High School. And at the same time, I'm carrying newspapers, I'm on the safety patrol, I, I take shop, and I do all the things that I did in those days, as well as we owned a service station. And after school, I'd go in the service station, do my homework, and at the same time, work as a mechanic, and do, uh, I was one of the first ones to be able to walk on a automatic transmission because in 1948 they came out, Oldsmobile came out with automatic transmissions. And at uh, 16 I was one of the youngest state inspectors allowed to inspect a vehicle for safety because we had the safety stickers, the inspection stickers that we now have. And while I was working and carrying newspapers, I was carrying three routes of newspapers, we had a customer that belonged in the Army Reserve. And when I turned 18, he came to me and he said, Jay, you need to join our unit. I said, well, I'm registered for the draft. He said, don't worry about that. You come and join our unit. So I went with him and I joined the 80th Division, 318th Infantry Division at the JAG Department. So I worked with lawyers and officers, and when I was going to high school, I figured I need to be able to have the skills to work. So I took typing, and I took the kind of skills that would help me in the civilian life. And when I joined the 80th Division, they uh, sent me to school to learn how to do military forms because they wanted me to work in the office typing up documents and such. Would you mind moving a little closer to the microphone? Thank you. You can okay. move the chair in too if it'll help. After uh, 15 minutes in class, I ended up teaching the class. Because of my typing skills, I was better than the instructors they had. So when I came back, my commanding officer says, uh, Ibsen, you're going to be teaching typing. I said, Colonel, I'm not a teacher. I don't know how to make a lesson plan. He says, don't worry about it. He assigned a major to do my lesson plans, and I was doing the floor work. I ended up teaching three different courses, office equipment, typing, and wheel vehicle mechanics. And you were 16 years old? No, by that time I was 18. So, all of a sudden, my selective service number comes up, and I'm called for the draft, which was at that time on a uh, uh, ride by Lowe's, well, the Lowe's uh, is in Richmond right now. Were you, were you a U.S. citizen yet? Yes. So uh, my draft number comes up, 
and I go to the draft, and, I, and that was during the Korean campaign. So uh, I said, okay, uh, I'm ready, but I don't want to go in as a private. I want to go in as a sergeant. Well, who the hell are you to tell us you want to go in as a sergeant? I said, well, I'm a sergeant. Why don't I want to go in as a private? What do you mean you're a sergeant? I said, well, call up my commanding officer. Here is, his, here is my ID. They called up, and my officer laid them out. I was one of his top instructors. How dare they try to draft me? So, of course, I got uh, out of the draft. It was during the Korean com com conflict. And I prepared our unit with everything that had to be for three years. I was the only guy allowed to use a 45 on the range without a safety officer. Where were, where were you stationed during the, your time in the military? Uh, for the most part, the only time I had to go somewhere is for summer training. The rest of the time I taught. And uh, headquarters was in Roseneath, on, uh, uh, where the Gay Community Center is right now. Sherwood. On Sher uh, Med Sherwood. Sherwood Avenue, I'm sorry. <laughs> Start to forget things. Sherwood Avenue, it's now the, the Gay Community Center is in our headquarters building. Later on, they moved us to the hospital. Okay. Well, let's fast forward. Uh, the Richmond Holocaust Museum is, in uh, many, many ways, your crowning achievement. I'm sorry, the Virginia Holocaust Museum is your crowning achievement. Uh, how did that come to be? Well, I told you in the beginning about the Valentine when I came to give a lecture. That lecture was so successful that a couple of friends of mine came to me and said, Jay, we need to build a museum in Richmond. I said, you guys are crazy. You've got, I was in business. By that time, we had 38 employees. We had a couple of branch stores. Our company was American Parts Company. And... I was, uh, you know, I was involved in Holocaust education with people, but I wasn't thinking about building a museum. Uh, so they kept saying, oh, but just think, Richmond needs a museum. I said, with Washington being so close, when I was in business, I didn't like competition. Oh, who wants a competitor? You want to get all the market you can. So finally I said, I'll tell you what. We'll go to Washington, and if they say okay, I'll think about it. Well, Al Rosenbaum and Mark Feather, Mark Feather used to manufacture the newspaper 50 plus and Richmond Parents. And Al Rosenbaum was a businessman, and uh, it didn't take 24 hours. They had an appointment for us to come to Washington. We came to Washington, and they realized who I was, that a picture of me in the, uh, the archives in line to be deported, they said, you need to build a museum with your story. I said, no, I don't. There were people that suffered worse than I did. People that were in Auschwitz, that have the ID numbers, that suffered. I didn't suffer. I had my parents and all. They said, yeah, but we have a fake story, the Daniel story. But you are the real Daniel. And if you want to build the museum, we're going to give you cobblestones from the Warsaw Ghetto and the railroad tracks from the guest chambers of Treblinka that we've got in a warehouse. I said, now those are two things that could really put on an effect. We came to Richmond. I didn't have any money for a museum. Al says to me, I'm going to give you money. Don't worry about it. Gave me a check for $500. So... I mean, that's generous of him, but you <laughs> need more than that for a museum. I went to uh, my synagogue, and we had just moved the school building. 
and the school building next to the synagogue, which my uncle, my mother's uncle actually, helped build, was vacant. Which synagogue? Temple Bethel on okay. Grove Avenue. And are, we, are you referring to the new school building off Parham Road now? That's the new school building. So uh, I went to the board, and I had a couple of friends of mine. I was a past president of the synagogue, and they all talked it over and said, okay, we're going to let you have the school building, no charge. So they gave me the school building. Now I had to build uh, the museum, you know, needed to build the hiding hole, needed to build a, a guest chamber, needed to build the fence to get in and out. So uh, I was lucky, and volunteers came, artists and people from, uh, students from the school systems that could paint and all that kind of stuff. And we built the museum, and I started giving lectures, and word started passing, and traffic got tied up on Roseneath Road with school buses, and all of a sudden the board tells me, we can't accommodate you. You got to move. You're taking up too much of our resources, you're taking people into the synagogue that's taking up room, then our janitors have to clean after you, and we can't take on that extra You were too burden. successful. <laughs> so I start looking, and a guy tells me uh, that he was knew somebody that was building uh, apartments and stuff, on Kerry Street, the 2100, 2100 block of Kerry, and perhaps they could give me a place to have my museum. So it was a Jewish firm, and I went to them, and they said, well, we wouldn't have enough room for you, but you know the building next to us, which is the building that was American tobacco. It built, it's a warehouse and it belongs to the city, belongs to the state, and nobody can buy it because it's not available for commercial use. But you as a non-profit organization, maybe you can get it. So I said, well, let me try. I was politically active in both parties so I hooked up with uh, Eric Cantor, and he said, well, let me take you to the secretary of the Commonwealth and see what he can do. I went over to the secretary of the Commonwealth, and he said to me, hell, we piss that kind of money away every day. Let me put it in the governor's budget and see what happens. He put it in the governor's budget, and I went to one of the schools that I gave lectures to, and I asked the teacher, it was a private school, I said, can you take your students and put them in their school uniforms and go to the General Assembly with me and pass out a short video that I made and a request that they give me the building to build a museum. It was a good civic lesson for the t students, so she did. We came and visited all the members of the General Assembly, leaving a vid short video of what the museum would mean and a request. Then, when we finished with that, uh, the Penny Rose, who was the wife of the Armenian Resources president at that time, was in the General Assembly. 
she invited the students to come out in the middle of the floor of the General Assembly and introduce them why they were here. That was the civic lesson. And when it came to a vote, I was voted a building for one dollar for the Virginia Holocaust Museum. And everything inside, it was a mess. So gradually again with volunteers and the Austrian government sent me a student as a volunteer instead of military service, his job was to work with me. And we started renovating that building and then uh, we had, when I needed to get the railroad tracks and the cobblestones, I was still in business. I called up a trucker that was a customer of mine. I said, look, I've got cobblestones and railroad tracks in Baltimore at a warehouse. Could you pick them up for me? He went, sent an 18-wheeler to pick it up, brought them to me, and didn't charge me a nickel. And customers of mine helped me renovate the building. They did some of the construction work on the outside, concrete work, uh, and no charge. And that's how I started uh, the museum at uh, 2000 East Cary. Wow, that's a very impressive story. Uh, and to have this happen here in Virginia, here in the Iron City of Richmond. I was there just last night and got to see it. Oh, uh, just moving on as we wrap things up. I just like to get your thoughts uh, after everything you've seen, experienced the highs and lows of hum of human of humanity. Are you optimistic about the future? To tell you the truth, I stay upset continuously. I'm a news junkie. I watch the news. I see that our neighbors, I'm talking about American neighbors, cannot get along with each other. Our country right now is so divided, it terrifies me. There is so much hate, and especially right now in the news with the new people that we've got elected, that hate the Jews. If I cut your finger, my finger, somebody from South Africa, what color is the blood? Red. It's all red. We're all God's children, regardless which way we choose to go to God. We're all created equal. And people don't understand. I have so many, Bishop Sullivan, the Catholic bishop, helped me build a museum. He gave me money from his own estate to help me build a museum. He is the first, was the first person to have a statue, Rachel Wilding, weeping for her children on Catholic grounds. This statue was created by a Jewish artist, Linda Gissen. What better, better connection can there be between us? On his dying bed, I came to see him. I thought he was going to get out. He said, pray for me. I prayed for him. I walked out, I walked out of the room and he passed away. We had such a bond. I have a fantastic relationship with all different religions. And now we've elected a couple of women that want to take this country and turn it into a communist state. They don't understand what it is to live under communism. I did. They took everything we had, and that wasn't enough. And that's what they want for the American people. We're all equal, and, and I'm just distraught 
My doctor told me, stop watching the television. Stop watching the news. But I figure if I don't know what's going on, how am I going to be able to protect myself and my grandchildren? I have taught my children and my grandchildren how to defend themselves. They're all experts with a weapon. Amen to that. I remember when, after I came off active duty for the Army for initial training, one of the things I did was I purchased a firearm. I got something comparable to what I had learned, but trained with, uh, and had practice and experience with. And I think it's important for people to know that you can't rely on others. Uh, you have to rely on yourself and then your family. That's correct, and I'm licensed to carry it too. Amen. Well, before we sign off, do you have any closing message to all the viewers and listeners out there when, after this is put up, made available? Uh, my closing message is, we're all alike. Treat your neighbor as you would like to be treated. Your neighbor can save you. Your neighbor can kill you. And that's what happened. And unfortunately, right now, we're going closer to the killing side than we are the other way. Jay Epson, thank you so much for coming on to this morning for a Talk the Line with Matt Pensker. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for giving us your insight and your experience. It was my pleasure.